So go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Um, And if you guys are anything like me, then you guys like me treat things that have more value in a different way than you treat things that are cheap or even free, right? My expectation is that you would treat something that has a high dollar value much better than you would treat, I don't know, maybe um, a pine cone you found in the park that was free, that you stole from whatever city you were in, um, and you took it home and you're like, no, it's okay, you can scratch my mom's car, but don't touch my pine cone, right? That would be odd. Well, tonight, or tonight, (laughs) we've been in here so many Wednesday nights, I've now lost track, this morning, We're gonna talk about something with extreme value. Now, if you were with us about a month ago on July 30th, we started with this message all in. And we're talking about these two parables um, of the treasure in the field and the parable of the pearl of great price. So we're gonna go back through that and we're gonna review and we're gonna take these two parables as one. And the reason we're gonna do that is because the two parables are giving us one truth from two different directions, from two different ways, that it's a, as it were, a picture of the same thing. And for those of you guys who are photographers, you know more about this than I do. The picture is of the same thing, but the angle is a little different so that it would exaggerate or, or maybe not exaggerate, but point out certain features. You guys see what I'm saying? So that the object in the picture might be the exact same thing, but you can see it in a different light. So that's what we're gonna get into today. So hopefully you're in Matthew chapter 13. I'm gonna read verse 44 through 46, and then we'll get into it. So look at Matthew 13, verse 44. It says this, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. Let's pray. Father, uh, this morning, this study is yours. I pray that you would show these students through this study the great and awesome things that you have done. God, that you would teach us, Lord, about the redemption that's available in Christ. That you would teach us that you, by your spirit, through the gospel, are going after each and every one of us. There's some in here that don't want to be here. They have no desire to hear your word. They have no desire to know you. And yet, Lord, today you are going to knock on the door of their hearts. Oh God, I pray that you'd open their eyes to see and their ears to hear. God, soften their heart to understand so that they may come to that place where they know and believe that Jesus is Lord, that he died for their sins, that he rose from the dead, and that he's promised to come again. So Lord, we're looking forward to that coming, but I pray that every student in this room would be with you when you come. So God, would you be our teacher through your spirit this morning in Jesus' name, amen. So as I mentioned, the title of the message is All In, and this term all in initially comes from uh, playing poker and playing cards, and if someone has this hand or this card that they think, you know, is worth all that they've achieved, acquired at this point. It's worth everything. I'm willing to put all my trust in this one hand. What they would do is they would go all in. They would push all their money into the center. They say, oh, they're all in. And then the other person has to decide if, if they also want to do the same, right? And, and what it's become is it's kind of become this saying and this phrase that someone would say for them being totally sold out for something, So for me, growing up, I was totally sold out for sports. Everything came second to sports. I played baseball, I played soccer, then I ended up playing hockey for a majority of my life, and everything came second. School, in my mind, came second. Friends, if they weren't on my hockey team, second. My chores at home, second. Everything was on a a list, way down the line. There was one thing I was all in for. And some of you in this room have that one thing you're all in for. Well, I pray today that you would begin to change your mind and that you'd be all in for something entirely different. That doesn't mean you have to forsake the other things that you enjoy, but it does mean that your perspective would be proper. But now you might say, okay, now you're about to spend the next 38 minutes telling me why I need to be all in for Jesus. And I'm gonna say yes and no. Because if you were with us last time, you're gonna recognize that we're gonna see two examples of someone being all in this morning. 
we're going to see these two examples of someone willing to go all in. In one case, it was for the field, but specifically for the treasure. In the other case, it was for this one pearl of great price. But what you guys are going to recognize is that that person that's going all in is not you and me, but it's actually uh, a picture of an example of the Lord Jesus in what he did when he came and he gave his life. There was nothing more that heaven could give. And we're going to see that this morning. But before we get into that, I want to point something out that our culture has completely lost and completely fumbled the ball on, which is this. You and I were created for a purpose. We are not the result of millions or billions of years of accidental microscopic changes that brought you from being a little piece of bacteria that was not living. It was, you know, the lightning struck the mud and now it's living, it's alive. And now all of a sudden you're a complex human being. Some of you more complex than others. That's not the way, no, you were created for a purpose. And I think some of the reason that this world has lost its mind in this world is going into COVID hysteria, number two. The reason that that is happening is because they've misunderstood the purpose for which they've been born. If you come from an atheistic worldview or an evolutionary worldview, then your goal in life to stay along as live as you can and reproduce in your likeness. That is the goal of the evolutionary atheistic worldview, but it's a blind goal nonetheless. But instead, you were created for a purpose and that purpose was fellowship with God. Think about this for a moment. When God created Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden, it was not because he was bored. It was because he wanted to have, as it were, a person, another relationship where he could express his love and so that they could return and love him which is why he gave them a choice. He didn't make them robots. He said, hey, you can either love me and stay in my garden or you can eat of this tree and I will kick you out. And we know the story, right? And so there ends the story, no more fellowship with God. No, that's not the way it worked. Then God sought to bring redemption into the human race so that he could bring all of those people that were lost, beginning with Adam and Eve and everybody else who was born. He wanted to draw them back into fellowship with himself. So we have the Israelites coming into the promised land where God said, this land is where I dwell and I wanna have fellowship with you guys. And so he picks a nation and he puts this nation in the promised land. But what happens? Eventually they begin to sin and fall away. And so God gives them up and that's it. The story's over. No. Then you get into the judges and you have people like Gideon or Deborah or Samson And it ends with Samuel the prophet, where what is the purpose of the judges? They're cleaning out the land and returning the people to fellowship with their God, the purpose that they were created for. And then the judges, the time of the judges runs out when the Israelites say, we want a king like everybody else. We want to look like the rest of the world. And so God gives up on them and there ends the story. No. Then the prophets come and the prophets are speaking forth the words of God saying, basically return to God and he will return to you. Turn from your sins, return to God, and he will return to you. That's the story of the prophets. And so we see that we were created for this purpose, and when the purpose was broken, God didn't abandon the project, as it were. What he did is he sought to redeem and bring us back into fellowship with himself. We see as much in 1 John chapter 1. It says, that which we have seen and heard, and in that case, John is talking about Jesus. He said, we've seen him, we've heard him with our eyes, or (laughs) with our ears and our eyes. We've touched him with our hands, we knew Christ. So look at what he says. That which we've seen and heard, we declare to you. For this reason, that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. John says, come, come have fellowship with us, as we have fellowship with God and his son. This is the original purpose, but it was marred and complicated by sin. But then in Christ, God came into the world and restored the original purpose, which was what? Fellowship with God. So in Christ, the fellowship that was broken by sin, God restores. And this is why Jesus is so central this is why the other night when we did the Q&A and you guys asked, how do I talk to my coworker? And I said, just stick to Jesus. But they want to go, no, Jesus is central. If they get Jesus right, everything else will either fall into line or it's irrelevant. But Jesus is central. 
So the main point of our two parables today is the redemption we have in Christ. If you're taking notes, write that down. The main point of these two parables, if you leave and remember one thing, it's this. The main point of these parables is the redemption we have in Christ. John Phillips, a commentator, said, God has not abandoned this world. On the contrary, he sees treasure in it. God, as he looks at the world, and if you're anything like me, uh, you try to avoid the news cycle because it's depressing story after depressing story after depressing story, and you might wonder, why in the world has God not set this place on fire yet? And I'd be like, I agree. Why has he not? That day is coming, but it's not today. Well, why? Well, because he sees treasure in it, and he's still seeking to redeem those who are his. So we're going to see these two aspects of redemption today. We're going to see the general redemption, which is what we talked about last time. And all that means is that the whole world has redemption, listen, available to them. The entirety of the world, anybody who would come, any human that has ever lived has this redemption available to them. So you might be like, okay, so everybody's saved. No, because it's available, but it's also specific, meaning the redemption belongs specifically to those who believe. It belongs specifically to those who believe so that the door is open, but you still must enter in through the door, okay? We see this in John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world, the entirety of the world, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In that verse, we see that God so loved the world, the general, the entirety of the world that he gave his son, but it's only those who believe in him, that is, the specific redemption, only those who believe in him that have eternal life, everlasting life. Which brings us to our parables today. If you're a note taker, the first point is this, all in by a general purchase. And we're gonna talk about the the general redemption that is available to the entire world. So again, look back at verse 44. He says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, before we get into this parable, you guys, I told you last time, and I'll remind you again, this was a common practice in the Middle East. There were no banks, there were no credit cards, there was nowhere to keep your belongings safe. So what they would do is they would take their belongings, they'd go to an obscure part of their land, and they'd bury it. Now, you guys know as well as I do, the Middle East is a land that is constantly at war. They are constantly at war. And it was the same back then as it is now. So these people would bury their belongings in hope that maybe if the war passed over or if the marauders or robbers came through, that they wouldn't find the buried treasure, their buried personal treasure, and that they would just pass through. And then when it's all over, they could dig it back up and it's theirs. You guys follow what I'm saying? So what would happen is if either that person had died or they forgot about it and they sold the land, And the purchaser of the land bought it and they dug it up. They didn't have to go find out whose it was. It was their land so that everything within the land belonged to them. You guys follow me? If you're in your backyard digging this afternoon and you find like, I don't know, a box full of gold, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your parents because it's their house. But you're not under the obligation. You're like, well, that's a sad end to the story. Maybe they'll share with you or maybe not. Most of you are like, no, they wouldn't. (laughs) Yeah, they're... They're wise. Um, You don't have the responsibility to go through the archive to find out who owned that land before you and we're gonna return this to them. No, it's your land. If you find it in your land, it belongs to you. And that's what Jesus, that picture Jesus is using. So there's no sketchy like stuff going on here. Jesus isn't using this like sketchy character. Um, He's using a story to portray a heavenly truth. And if you've been with us in the parables, that's what a parable is. It's an earthly story that portrays a heavenly truth. So kind of like finders keepers. You guys remember doing that when you were younger? Some of you still do it. Um, and we're working on you on that. So let's go to our first sub point, which is this. A general purchase for a special treasure. A general purchase for a special treasure. And this is just the beginning of verse 44. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. I want you to notice something about this. Does it seem like he's interested in the field? Let me ask, you can shake your head or you can answer me. Does it seem like he's interested in the field? No, most of you are saying no. What is he interested in? The treasure, what he's interested in is what the field contains. So the treasure shows you the motive for which the field is purchased. 
It doesn't say that he walked across this fertile ground and thought, I can grow so many crops here. No, it says that he stumbled across this treasure and he decided to buy the field for the treasure. So we see his motive. It's obvious because it says that much. We don't have to guess. So now this is where Jesus' parable is going to mirror a heavenly truth. And the heavenly truth is this. The one that has come in to purchase the field is the Lord Jesus. Now the question is, what is the treasure? And for that, you have to look at Jesus' life. When Jesus came in to the world, does it say anything about his financial transactions? No. But when he was on the cross and he said to Telestai, it is finished, that was a financial term. And in that moment, he showed you what he came into the world to purchase. He came into the world to purchase salvation for mankind. And just like we saw in John chapter 3, 16, he redeemed, as it were, generally the entirety of the world in this way. Don't get this wrong, because there is a group out there that thinks that because Jesus died for the world, that everybody who's ever lived is going to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. What Jesus did in dying for the sins of the world is this. He made redemption and the forgiveness of sins available to every single person. Jesus's death was sufficient that if every person who ever lived wanted to go to heaven, they could. It was sufficient. But listen, it's only efficient or it only is applied to those who believe. Okay, so why did Jesus come into the world? Why did he come and redeem the world? 1 Timothy 1.15, we're actually gonna go over this verse on Wednesday night, but 1 Timothy 1.15 says this, This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance. Now, what he's going to tell you is why Jesus came. That Jesus, or that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul adds, of whom I am chief. You cannot separate the man from his message and you cannot separate the man from his mission. And when I say man, I mean the man Christ Jesus. You cannot take Jesus and separate him from his message, which is what cults do and a lot of liberal theologians do. They take Jesus and they like the idea of Jesus, but they separate him from his message and they separate him from his mission and they take away anything that would offend. But the Bible says that Jesus came into the world not to make you feel better, not to make you rich, not to make you even wise or smart. He can do those things if he wants to. He came into the world to save sinners. That was his mission. And we'll see in a minute, that was his message. So, Jesus comes into the world to save the individual, but just like in our parable, he purchases what is efficient or sufficient for the whole field, but his eye was on the treasure. So the question is, what is the treasure? Or rather, why would he do that? We'll get to the treasure in a minute, but why would Jesus do that? Well, that brings us to our second sub point, which is this, for a specific reason, for a specific reason. So a general purchase for a specific reason. Look at the middle part there of verse 44. He says, for joy over it, he goes. When this man stumbles across this treasure, it gives him joy, so he goes his way. Now, we're gonna talk about what he did, but his motive was joy. There's this joy that springs up in his heart. It it didn't say that he was covetous or greedy or anything else, but he finds this treasure. He's full of joy, so he goes. Well, the reason he was full of joy is because he knew what he was getting. He knew exactly what he was getting when he bought the field. He didn't have to wonder if it was going to be worth the purchase. He knew it was going to be worth the purchase. That word joy, it means cheerfulness, means calm delight, it means gladness or joy. And I will say that Jesus redeemed you and he redeemed me for the very same reason, for joy. The Bible says that it was the joy set before him is the reason he endured the cross. So that Jesus went through the most agonizing death of any human who's ever existed, for what reason? Joy. It was not obligation, it was not guilt, it was not need, it was love, and it was joy that caused Jesus to endure the horrors of the cross so that whoever would come to him would be saved. And just like in our parable, this guy, this man, he goes away and for joy, he is going to redeem the field. And we see that Jesus, when he was here, he was here for joy. And as we move quickly through this first parable, uh, let's look at the third sub point, which is this, a general purchase for a surpassing price. For a surpassing price. Look at the price he pays for the field. I alluded to this earlier, but this is going to be the key to understanding today. 
The end there of verse 44, it says, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Could you guys imagine? Think for a moment. Now, most of you don't own anything because your parents have purchased everything for you. And I remember telling my dad, that's my phone. And he said, who paid for it? And I said, you. (laughs) And I said, or he said, hey, I'm going to take your truck. I'm like, that's my truck. He's like, who paid for it? And I was like, you. He's like, that's my room. He's like, who pays for that room? I was like, you. So then when I turned 16, I thought I was cool because I got a job and started putting my own gas in the car. And now I was like, I can't wait till he asked me to drive my truck. That's my gas. He's like, in whose car? Yours. <laughs> and then I bought my own truck with my own gas. He said, hey, son, I'm gonna take your truck. I was like, but that's my truck. He's like, who pays for your insurance? I was like, <laughs> you. So then I got married and moved out and now I have my own stuff. And when my dad asked to borrow my truck, you know what I say? Of course, dad, you can take my truck. <laughs> my heart has changed. So think about this in your own life. Everything you own, except the clothes on your back. Do you have multiple pairs of shoes? They're gone. Multiple pairs of pants? Sold. Shirts? Sold. Hat? You don't need a hat. Just do your hair. Sold. (laughs) The boys wearing hats are like, well, hold on, buddy. I'll sell the shoes. (laughs) Right? What do you have? Bed? Sold. Bed frame? Sold. You have a carpet in your room? Like a rug? Sold. TV? Gone. Game system? See ya. Everything you own is gone for this one thing. Could you ever imagine doing that? I can't. I don't know what, there's nothing on this earth that I would sell all that I have to purchase. Now, I don't have a lot, so maybe that's why. I would, they'd be like, no, man, you're still falling short. You can't buy this. I'd be like, okay, never mind. Can I have my stuff back? Um, but look at what he pays. He pays all that he has. For him, the treasure in the field was worth everything else. Imagine finding something that was worth all of your stuff combined. It's been said that God bankrupted heaven for a time to redeem his people. God could not give more than Jesus for your redemption. How do I know? Jesus, when he prayed in the garden, he said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cut pass from me. If there was any other way to redeem you and me, God would have answered that prayer and Jesus would not have went to the cross. But God gave all that he had, as it were. He sent heaven's most valuable treasure into the earth. And in that way, he gave all that he had to purchase the treasure in the field. Romans 8.32 says he, speaking of God, did not spare his own son. Listen to this but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If you're in this room and you think God is withholding something from you, if you think God is just holding out on you, the Bible said that he gave his only son for you. So how will he not also with that give you everything? Do you know the two things that have been promised to you in the word of God? Clothing and food. That's it. Anything more you have, is God's grace. And so God did not spare his own son. He gave his own son, as it were. He sold, remember it's a parable, not an allegory. God didn't sell Jesus. But from the parable, we see the truth that God gave everything he had for this thing. So in our parable, the man buys the field and in the same general way, Christ redeemed made and, and made redemption available for the whole world. The man purchased the entire field to gain the treasure inside. Jesus redeemed the entire world to gain the treasure inside. Now what's the treasure? The treasure is all those who would believe in him. Jesus said, the Bible says that he'd look at his reward and be satisfied. All of those who would believe in him in the parable are seen in this treasure. So that God made it redemption available for the whole world, but it's those who believe who are redeemed. Which brings us to the second parable, and this is where we'll spend the rest of our time. So the second point is this, all in for a specific find. Now what you guys are gonna notice is this parable is very different because in the first parable, this guy just kind of stumbles upon the treasure. In this parable, he's actively seeking it out. So look at verses 44 or 45 and 46. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
Do you guys see something that looks a little familiar? Same storyline, do you guys see it? Okay, good, a few of you. It says that he sold all that he had. This is the repeated theme in these two parables and it is to be picked up on. That's why Jesus, how many of your parents repeat themselves? Anybody? Yeah, all of you? Yeah, as a parent, I also have to repeat myself. Why? There's two reasons why. One, you're not listening, which is probably the most common. Or two, they really want you to understand the importance of that thing, right? You guys concur, you guys agree? So Jesus repeats this same thing twice so that they would get it and they'd see it from a different angle. So the first parable, we see the general purchase to get the treasure in the field. But this parable, the merchant is going to go after the pearls. He's not going to stumble upon it. He's going to individually seek out these pearls. So let's look at these, these uh, couple points we have. The first one is this, a specific find that was worth seeking out that was worth seeking out. Now this is verse 45 in the beginning of 46. So look at it with me. It says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. And then notice when he found one pearl of great price. So this merchant is seeking after it. The word seeking means to seek, to endeavor. The picture here is of a merchant who's actively seeking out by going from place to place. Buried in that Greek word is not just kind of looking around like if you lost something at home, but what it is is he's up out of his house and he's going from market to market, place to place. And now I will say in the parable, because we can't allegorize it, he wasn't just seeking one pearl, but the point is he was seeking and found one pearl. So this man, he's seeking, he's looking after these things. Well, in Luke 19, 10, we're gonna find that our God, that Jesus is a seeking savior. Look at what it says in verse 10. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's come to seek and to save. That word to seek is the exact same word we find in our parable. So we see that Jesus was not on vacation here. He came on a mission to redeem mankind and to purchase eternal life for lost humanity. That when Jesus came, he didn't come to seek for pleasure. He didn't come to seek for status. He didn't come to seek for power. He came to seek and save. He wanted to purchase life and he did. He, he purchased life, life for lost humanity. But now I want you to notice something and we're gonna go through this in a moment. You are not saved by church membership. You can't be. That's one of the reasons that from the very beginning when Calvary Chapel started, Chino Hills started as a home Bible study with six people. They never once have had church membership. Why? Because if you become a member of a church, there's this false security. The only member of a church or the only church you need to be a member of is the church of Jesus Christ. The one true church that is made up of many churches. Was Siri correcting me there? <laughs> I don't care what Siri has to say. Um, you are not and cannot be saved by church membership. And I've talked to people before and they're like, oh no, I'm a part of XYZ church, so I'm good to go. And I'm like, no, you're not. That doesn't mean anything. You're not saved by religion, which a lot of, a lot of people uh, trust in. You're not saved by lineage. Now in the United States, most of us don't know what we are, right? You don't know where your family's from. Some of you do, but most of us don't know what we are. We're all mutts. So in our, our culture, it's kind, of di it's kind of weird to say you're not saved by lineage. You're like, well, yeah, obviously. But in other cultures, especially in the Middle East and especially in the first century Judaism, they thought because they were sons of Abraham, they were going to heaven. But Jesus says, nope. You're not saved by good works. I've talked to so many people that I ask them, hey, are you certain you're going to heaven? They're like, yes, I am certain I'm going to heaven. I say, great. On what basis are you certain you're going to heaven? Well, um, and I say, okay, time out. Like if God, like, you get to heaven, you die today, God forbid, but it could happen. If you die today and you're standing before God and God says, why should I let you into heaven? On what basis? Most people answer, well, I did more good than evil in my life. 90 plus percent of people answer that way when I ask that question. But the Bible says that our good works are like dirty rags. They're like dirty towels. They're not worth anything. Why? Because they were done with dirty hands. If you have not been redeemed, then they've been done with dirty hands. I will say this. If you are redeemed, the Bible says, be careful to maintain good works and you will be rewarded for those things that you do. So good works are not irrelevant, but they're not able to save you. There's nothing that we can do. We were saved because Jesus came after us, came after you as an individual pearl. 
He came to seek and save the lost. Now, I want to go through a list of people, and I want to show you just in a few, I could have bored you guys to death. You're like, you've already done that. Okay, I could have bored you guys to more death with this list, but I picked out different ones that show from different angles how Jesus sought out and saved people in his earthly ministry. And he's doing the very same thing today. As you guys go out and as you share the gospel with your friends or share the gospel with that person you run into and you feel led to do that, what it is is Jesus is reaching out through the gospel to seek to save that person. And now they either have to choose, they're willing or not. But look through Jesus's life, look at all these people that Jesus came to individually. Philip in John chapter one. In John chapter one, Jesus, it says, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. He could have walked by Philip and it could have been, that would have been it and Philip would have just went on his day. But what he did is he went out of his way and he said, Philip, follow me. Now, I believe personally there was an interaction before this that's not recorded in the scriptures. I believe that. I can't prove it, but I believe it. But at some point, Philip became convinced that Jesus was worth following. And not only that he was worth following, that he was worth bringing his friends to Jesus. Because that was Philip. Jesus found him and said, follow me. Very simple. And some people, when they come to faith, they hear the gospel. They say, that's true. You're right. I have sinned. You're right. I do need a savior. Okay, I will follow Jesus. It's that simple. But then there's people like Nathaniel in John chapter one. Now, Philip... After he starts following Jesus, he goes over to Nathaniel, his buddy, and says, hey, Nathaniel, uh, we found the Messiah. He's from Nazareth. Now, Nathaniel's a critic. And Nathaniel says, can, wait, what? Uh, uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, that would be like someone coming to you and saying, the savior of the world is in San Francisco. You'd be like, can anything good come out of San Francisco? Like you can't, it's not even safe to like walk in broad daylight there. You get robbed. Like there's, there's literally needles and people sleeping on the sidewalk. Like it's bad. That's what Nathaniel's thinking. Can, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's a critic. He's asking questions. Now in this room, there's no doubt in my mind that some of you guys are critics. Now listen, hear me out. I'm not insulting you <laughs> yet. Hear me out. Some of you guys, maybe you look at your parents and you see them proclaim to be Christians, but their whole life is contrary. They live a life completely contrary, and it causes you in your mind to become a critic to say, I don't know if this gospel's true. I don't know if Jesus really is a savior. I don't know if he really does transform lives because my parents claim to be Christians, and they come, and they sit at church, and they raise their hands, but then they come home, and they mistreat me and my siblings, or they come home, and they live a completely different life, and that might cause you, like Nathaniel, to be a critic. You'd be like, what? No. That's not true. Can't be true. Because he's from Nazareth. What, what, is, what, is your, what is your thing? Because my parents. Because I have a friend that mistreated me who claimed to be a Christian. Well, because of all the, the contradictions in the Bible. Look at how Jesus handle, handles Nathaniel's criticism. I love this. It says, when Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him, he said, behold, an Israelite in whom is no deceit. All he said is, this is a man of integrity. Nathaniel said to him, now picture, this is a San Francisco savior. You guys follow me? This is Jesus of Nazareth in his mind. Now he was actually not from Nazareth. Where was he born? Okay, but he lived in Nazareth. So he came out of Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, how do you know me? If somebody came from San Francisco and said, hey, Colin, I'd be like, how do you know me? Hold on, I don't trust you. Jesus answered, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now this kind of comes out of left field. Look at verse 49. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. You're like, what? Like does not compute. Like I saw you under the fig tree. You're the son of God. Now, I'm not alone in, in believing this, but I believe personally that something happened under that fig tree where Nathanael was sitting Fig trees have huge leaves. They give good shade. And now I believe personally that he was sitting down there and he was having a, a discourse with, with God, that he was talking to God about something, that there was something in his heart. There was some anxious thought or some burden or some question he had, and he's, he's wrestling with God. Maybe that was Nathaniel's place to meet with the Lord and pray. And so as Nathaniel's coming, 
Jesus says, hey, you know that wrestling match you're having? I know all about it. When you were under that fig tree, when you were struggling with God, I know about it. There was something that happened there that when Jesus said, I saw you there in the midst of your struggle, I saw you there in the midst of your devotion, in the midst of your worship, that Nathaniel turns and says, you're the son of God. So let me share with you guys who might be critics today, who maybe there's somebody in your life who's a Christian that's wronged you, or maybe you've bought into the YouTube theology of having contradictions throughout the Bible, that if you would come to Christ, that he would treat you just like he treated Nathaniel. He'll say, hey, in all those struggles and all those wrestlings and all the things you're struggling with, I saw you. And he'll meet you right there. So he comes to Nathaniel. He seeks out Nathaniel. In John chapter four, we have the woman at the well. We're gonna go over this very quickly, but I want you to notice, if you're a person who marks up your Bible, go to John chapter four, because there is a significant word. It says in verse four, but he, speaking of Jesus, needed to go through Samaria. Now, I should have put up a map for you guys, but he did not need to go through Samaria. He could have taken one of the other many routes that Jews usually took to avoid Samaria. But the Bible says he needed to go through Samaria. Why did he need to go through Samaria? Because he was a seeking savior and he was seeking out the lost. And so he gets into this discourse and this conversation with this woman at the well. And he ends up saying to a woman of Samaria, she came to drew water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, culturally, this is totally unacceptable. A Jewish male talking to a Samaritan woman and she basically says as much, but it's culturally unacceptable for this to happen because Jesus was alone, she was alone, it would be seen as scandalous. But Jesus says, give me a drink. And then they, they go on in this conversation and what Jesus does in this conversation is what he does is he corrects her false idea of worship because she was worshiping at a different temple, the Samaritan temple. She was offering sacrifices, not at the temple in Jerusalem where God said his name would be. So she followed this false worship system and he explains that to her. But then he also does this thing. He said, there's really one thing that is separating you from God and it's your sin. Your sin has separated you from God and he uh, basically he calls her out on it. And in the, the middle of this conversation about her sin, she comes to the, rec the realization that you are more than a man. Are you a prophet? And Jesus says that he's the son of God. And then, so what does the woman at the well do? She runs into the city, she grabs all the people and she brings them out. And the Bible says, Jesus said that the fields were white for harvest. There were many people that come to faith through that moment. So why did Jesus need to go through Samaria? Well, because he had an appointment. He had an appointment. And there's some of you in here today, if this is your first time at church or your hundredth time at church, the truth is coming to bear on your heart and on your mind that Jesus has been seeking after you. He's been coming after you with your parents sharing with you or your friends sharing with you. He's been speaking to you in a way that you know that it's not you. And he's seeking after you. And like the woman at the well, he will point out the one thing that's separating you from, from God and that is your sin. And now we have a lame man in John chapter five. And by lame, I don't mean uncool. I mean that he literally could not walk. And look at what it says. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? So Jesus comes upon this guy. In my view, Jesus knew all things. He went out of his way to come to this one lame man. And now Jesus asks him, and this is key, do you want to be made well? Why is that key? Because he's asking you the same question today. Jesus could have, as the son of God, as God incarnate, gone over to this man and said, hey, uh, get up. The guy's like, I like being paralyzed. He's like, oh, it's too bad because I'm God and I'm telling you to get up. He could have. But instead he says, do you want to be made well? And in the same way, when Jesus comes to you, when he's seeking after you individually, he's going to ask, do you want to be made well? And this man, he accepts the offer to be made well. Jesus says, you know, pick up your bed and, and go show yourself to the priest, basically. Um, and as he goes, um, he gets in trouble for carrying his bed on the Sabbath because of the, 
the Pharisees abusing what God had initially attended, initially wanted the Sabbath to be, which was a day of rest. He didn't mean you can't carry your bed. He said, don't go work your nine to five is, is more so uh, what it meant. Set that side a day to worship God. And so the Pharisees get on him. And at some point he makes his way into the temple, this, this formerly lame man. And look at what it says. Look at verse 14. It's on the screen for you guys, or if you have your Bibles open, verse 14. He says, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said, see, you've been made well. But notice, sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. What Jesus says is don't go out and use this gift, this liberty for sin. There's some commentators who believe that it was sin that got him into that condition in the first place of being paralyzed. And that's why Jesus confronts him and says, hey, don't go do the same thing you did before. Don't waste this. And so he says, go and sin no more. And for those of you who want to be made well today, he would respond to you in the same way. I've made you well, now go and sin no more. That brings us to the blind man in John chapter nine. In John chapter nine, there was a a man who was born blind and Jesus comes and heals him. And now this healing took place on the Sabbath, which again, the Pharisees had exaggerated the Sabbath laws and they said healing was working. So even though there was this miraculous supernatural healing, they didn't like it and they end up kicking this guy out of the synagogue and kicking him out of the temple because he was healed on the Sabbath and he actually kind of got sarcastic with the Pharisees and he's like, like, why do you guys keep asking me questions? Do you also want to follow Jesus? And they they weren't about the sarcasm. Um, So they kicked him out. But we pick up the story in verse 35. It says, when Jesus heard they had cast him out, look at what he does. And when he had found him, Jesus went after him. He said, do you believe in the son of God? And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, you've both seen him and it's him who's talking to you. So Jesus goes after this man. First, he heals him, he opens his eyes and then Jesus begins to teach him about himself. And in the Christian life, when you come to Jesus, it doesn't end there, it starts there. And then you learn and you grow in your faith and likeness to Jesus. Let's look at Matthew, the tax collector, in Luke chapter five. Matthew, being a tax collector, was known for ripping off his countrymen, being a traitor and working for the Roman government. I think most of you guys are aware of that. But look at this. It says, after these things, he went out and saw a tax collector and cursed him in his heart for being such a wicked man. That's not what it says. It says he found a tax collector named Levi, or Matthew, sitting at the tax office. And, when he, and he said to him, follow me. Now listen to Matthew's response. So he left all, rose up and followed him. Matthew says, what he's offering is more than what I have. So he forsook his job. He forsook everything he had and said, I'm willing to follow Jesus. And as Jesus is seeking out some of you, even right now, your best response would be to forsake the things you're holding on to and to run after and follow after him. We see a similar thing with Peter and Andrew. In Mark chapter one, it says, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew and totally ignored their existence and walked on by. No. It says, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. I have more examples, but for time's sake, I'm going to end there with my examples. And then we'll get into the last point. But here's the point. There were many ways and there were many people that Jesus sought out individually. We cannot be saved by being part of a group. We cannot be saved by getting the group on two for one sale where, hey, you buy it and I'll just come in with you. No. You're saved because Jesus is individually seeking out everyone, but you have to respond to him. You have to respond. He's not going to tie you up, handcuff you, and take you into heaven as his prisoner. He's not gonna do that. So Jesus came seeking and to save, but this happens as individuals encounter him and believe. Jesus found each one individually, just like the list we just went through, and in many different ways. There was not just one way, and if we went around and shared all our testimonies, there are many different ways that Jesus has come to each of us, but the message and Jesus' mission is always the same, and it's pointing towards faith in himself, and the forgiveness of sins. So let me ask you a question, and you're the only one that can answer this. Has this happened to you? 
If I were to ask you, what is your story? Because if I went to Matthew Levi, he would say, I was sitting there convicted of my sin and the son of God came by and said, follow me. And I knew I had to do it. That's Matthew Levi's story, right? The woman at the well, if I could bring her up on stage and say, hey, what's your story? She'd say, you know what? It was day by day, mundane, same thing over and over. I was living in my sin and he came to me and he spoke to me so gently. And he said, you need to turn from your sin and believe in me. Or the lame man, I say, hey, walk up on stage. And he's like, gladly. I say, well, what was it for you? He asked if I wanted to be made well and I knew in that moment I had to forsake my sin and follow him. Has that happened to you? Only you can answer that question. Which brings us to our our last point, which is this. A specific find that was worth everything. A specific find that was worth everything. Look at the end of verse 46. So after this merchant finds this one pearl, It says that he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, if we get this backwards, we're gonna get all messed up because we were not so wonderful that Jesus just had to have us. You guys remember parables are not allegories. I'm gonna keep repeating that so you remember it. Um, Parables are not allegories. So you could be like, oh, oh, okay. I'm a wonderful pearl. (laughs) Guys, if you say that, we'll have a conversation after, (laughs) after service. Ladies, you do what you want. No, you're not like, oh, I'm just so wonderful. God just had to have me. No, it was his great love that caused God to send his son, not our lovableness. I made up that word just for this, lovableness. It was his transcending love, not our ability to be loved. Nothing that we could offer. Do you wanna understand the depths of God's love? If you're sitting in here today and you wanna know God's great love, then you need to look at Jesus. You need to look at what it was that God gave to redeem mankind. You need to look at what it, what it cost Christ to redeem you and me. In Titus chapter three, verses four and five, it says, but when the kindness and love of God, our savior towards man appeared, notice, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, not because we were lovable, not because we were awesome, not because we were cool. No, nothing that we've done, but it says, but according to his mercy, he saved us. That word mercy, it means to be kind when you have the power to judge. That's what it means. So that if someone has the right to make a judgment, but instead they decide to be kind, that's showing mercy. If one of you, after upper room, backed into my truck and you saw my eyes of fire, And I was like, that's the only thing that's really actually mine in this world. Um, Everything else belongs to my wife and daughters. But I said, you know what? I have the right to take down your insurance. I do. You're like, but but no, you have to be nice. I don't have to be nice. I could take down your insurance. I have the right to do that lawfully. But I'm like, you know what? Hey, you're a horrible driver. I get it. Like, I forgive you. Go. Um, That would be merciful. Maybe not the horrible drive part. <laughs> That's not merciful. But when you have the power to either judge or enforce the law and instead you show kindness, that's mercy. So God, according to his mercy, saved us. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 10, in this is love. Notice, not that we loved God. We did not love God first. Nobody has ever loved God first. But rather, he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Again, we see the mission of Jesus being the propitiation. That word propitiation simply means the turning away of God's wrath. It's a sacrifice that satisfies wrath. That's what that means. And so, as we conclude, God gave his son, Jesus gave his life. Our response ought to be, our response must be to give ourselves to him to receive the gift of eternal life. In Romans 2, 4, it says, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering notice, not knowing that it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. When you recognize what it was that God did to save you, and you recognize that you were not particularly lovable when he saved you, it makes you recognize how great God's love really is. And it causes you to take notice. But at the end of the day, 
you have to make a choice for yourself. Jesus has made it available. Jesus has even sought you out. He's convicted you of your sin. He's convinced you that he exists and there's a God in heaven, but you have to receive the gift of eternal life for that to apply to you. So Jesus went all in to make salvation available to anyone who comes. Let me ask you a question. Are you all in? Are you like Matthew, the tax collector, having given up all the other things of this life if you would just lay hold of Jesus? If you haven't, then I would tell you today is the day. Let's pray. Father, the clock has just struck noon, Lord, as it is now officially afternoon. God, so I pray that this afternoon that these students sitting in here would recognize your great love and in recognizing your great love that they would respond to you. Many of these students already have. Many of these students, they know you, they love you, and they're walking with you. God, may today be a reminder of what you have done in that you sent your only begotten son into the world so that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. Lord, for those students in this room that have given their life to you, God, may they be full of joy. God, may they rejoice in the salvation that you have purchased. May they not have any condemnation in their lives. If there's any sins they're wrestling with, God, give them strength over it so that they could walk in the freedom that you've provided. But Lord, for those in here that you're seeking them out, and right now, there's no doubt in my mind you're speaking to them. God, I pray that today would be the day that they'd call upon the name of the Lord. That they would say, Jesus, you're right. I have sinned. I do deserve condemnation for my sins. But you died on my behalf. You died in my place. You resurrected from the grave on the third day to prove that all you said was true. And now you're coming back to judge the living and the dead. Lord, and that they would recognize that that's it. In a moment, they could be born again. Their address could be changed forever. They could be reunited to, fellow, reunited to fellowship with you, which was your initial purpose and intent, which was restored in Christ and Christ alone. So Lord, may today be the day of salvation for them. In Jesus' name.